Thank you, Matt. Well, I heard it again recently. You know, that word, surreal, the most overused word in our language these days, because we have truly lived through some surreal times, haven't we? A person who was watching one of the recent billionaires launched into space said that uh, said surreal as he described what it was like to watch the founder of Amazon rocket off into space and then actually return. I'm not sure that any of us thought he would return, but they did. The word is usually heard after someone sees a tornado. I mean, that's always, right? You inter interview anybody in the South after a tornado, you're going to get some interesting descriptions. But inserted in all of those is surreal. Or people who experience a hurricane. Or maybe catches a glimpse of Sasquatch running through the woods. It seems to be the only word that we can find in our language for something that we see or experience that defies our common descriptions. Well, I am not sure that there is a word for surreal in Aramaic or Greek, but the disciples and the people around Jesus would have used it a lot, especially in what we've just heard in John's Gospel this morning. Surreal might have been an understatement. John tells us that large crowds are following Jesus because they saw the signs that He was doing for the sick. All right, So they're, they're watching Jesus interact with all of these sick people. And they're seeing signs from God that this, these signs pointing to, to this Jesus as being the one we need to follow. As being Messiah. The one we've been waiting for all along. Everywhere He went, people gathered with their sick. And it must have been the most amazing experience for the people who watched Jesus at work with His healing touch. If we're not careful, we just gloss over that in our Gospel readings, don't we? We think, okay, well, He healed some more sick. Seems like Jesus was always healing the sick. But think about it for a minute. Think about watching Jesus heal someone that you know has been sick for a very long time. Someone who has sought out healing from all different places and in different ways and nothing has worked. And in strolls Jesus into your village. And you see Jesus take some mud, some dirt on the ground and spit into it and put it on a blind guy's eyes and then all of a sudden he can see. Think about all the many ways that Jesus healed people. And what it would have been like to be right there watching Jesus do all of this. And it would have been even more amazing for the people whom Jesus healed. I mean, think about being that one that has been blind all of your life. Or someone who uh, has not been able to hear. Or someone who is unable to walk and to get around. Think about what it would have been like to be one of them. The blind being able to see. The deaf able to hear. The mentally ill experiencing peace. And finally, some serenity. The crippled becoming mobile. And others all becoming recipients of God's healing touch. All through Jesus. Well, if that wasn't enough to wow the crowds, Multiplying five loaves and two fish surely would. Now, you've heard a lot about fish and loaves today. And it's not just because we are serving fish for lunch. Although, there was a little trickery in that. And if we'd been in the chapel, you would be able to smell the fish. And that would have just made the point even more. But can you imagine how big the eyes were of that boy who had the five loaves and two fish. Can you imagine what that would be like to be Him? His life would be changed forever after what Jesus did. And the giant crowd of hungry people must have been blown away by Jesus' catering skills as they were able to eat until fully satisfied 
You do know that, right? There was some left over. There was more than enough. Even the dinner crowd at Golden Corral would have been amazed, right? No joke. As John noted, they were saying, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. This is him. They're saying to one another and saying to themselves, this is the guy. This is the one that God has sent to us. Then there were the disciples. I mean, they had a front row seat to what happened that day, but also all the other times that Jesus did miraculous things. And just in the few verses that we have heard for today, uh, the disciples saw Jesus healing the sick, multiplying bread and fish, but then something else that would blow their minds. As they shipped out that evening onto the Sea of Galilee, no doubt talking about, uh, the, I mean, just talking nonstop about what Jesus just did. They looked out on the water and saw through the storm, the, the, the stormy sea, that Jesus was walking on water toward them. They were in the boat, and we've heard stories like this before, right? The last one we heard, Jesus was asleep in the boat. But here, Jesus is not even in the boat. He is walking toward them from the shore. And their conversation must have gone completely quiet as their brains were trying to catch up with their eyes. They were trying to process and to make some sense of what was going on. Once they saw and heard that it was Jesus, uh, John tells us, they wanted to take Him into the boat. Like, Jesus, get into this boat! And they wanted to be with Him. Paul is caught up in that kind of wonder as he writes to the Ephesian church, which we heard just a moment ago. He wants them to see and to comprehend what God had done for them in Jesus. He prays. This is a beautiful prayer. He prays that they might have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Isn't that great? Paul wants them to know that. Paul wants them in the midst of persecution and hardships and death and challenges, all the things that are going on around them. Paul prays for them this powerful prayer. He says, so that they would be filled with all the fullness of God. Just like that crowd that was there when Jesus multiplied the fish and the loaves. They were filled with the fullness of God. And Paul prays that the Ephesian church would be too. In his prayer, he gives glory to God who he says, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. So Paul is caught up in awe of what God has done in and through Jesus. And he wants the same for the church at Ephesus. As we hear how how the things Jesus did had such an impact on the crowds, and on the disciples and Paul. We must know this morning that Jesus is still amazing. Right? Just say that to somebody around you this morning. Say, Jesus is still amazing. Go ahead. Say it again. I don't know. Say it again. Isn't He? That God continues to do powerful things through Jesus. Yes, even today, Jesus is still at work. But do we see Him? And do we see the amazing things that Jesus does? Are we getting close enough to Jesus to watch what happens when He interacts with people who are sick? Do we see what happens when Jesus takes the little that we give Him and increases it beyond our wildest imagination? Are we able to see through the storms of our lives as a a Jesus who comes to us right in the midst of them to calm our fears, 
and to just be with us. Looking back at what Jesus did while in our world is an ongoing need for us to remember how God worked through Him. And our time together in Sunday school, or and I think we had a pretty good group in Sunday school this morning, or in our study groups like midweek, doing that is one of the best ways that we can look back and see what God did through Jesus. And looking at the Gospels together, discussing our thoughts and our questions with each other. And by the way, at Church of the Highlands, we welcome all kinds of questions and comments. That's how we learn from one another. But also, learning about Jesus in the sense of getting a broader view of what Jesus said and did. And that's why it is so important for each of us to be in a group. You and I will be wowed by what we see and comprehend together. I know that is true because I've been in groups with you. And sometimes the take or the thoughts that you have about Jesus just blow me away. And they help me see a Jesus in a whole different way. And we need that. Well, looking at what Jesus did is important, but we also can see and comprehend amazing things about Jesus in what He is doing right now. Right here where we live. It happens when we, the body of Christ, who is in the world today, when we live as His hands and His feet in this world, through us, He can go wherever His healing touch is needed. Share good news with the poor and the oppressed. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Confront evil. Give comfort to the healing. Provide refuge to the alien. Encourage the discouraged. And even love the unlovable. Our missional ministry teams give opportunity for us to do all of these things. And the list can go on, but just in doing those actions, we will not only show Jesus to the world, we will be wowed and amazed by seeing Jesus up close and personal in our service and in the people we serve. This past week, um, I had opportunity to, to see a little bit of that. Um, as I was, we had um, the group uh, the, of women that came, and by the way, there were 17 of them, not 70, not 70 or 80. Uh, there were 17 uh, who were with us from uh, Haiti. And they um, were asylum seekers coming here, and they'd been in detention centers. And so as they were at the uh, bus station, uh, people uh, went to get them. Uh, people helping, like Church for the Highlands and others, going to help and get them so that they could have a place where they could talk to their families and be able to uh, get travel arrangements made so that they could go to Miami or New York or Connecticut or wherever it is that they were going. And they were only with us just for a short amount of time, but it was amazing to hear their stories. And last week, you got to hear one of them uh, who was still here with us, and she shared a powerful uh, story. But I, uh, we had some, some uh, other asylum seekers that were eating with us in the Highland Blessing dinner. And uh, most of them were from Cuba and Venezuela. And during the prayer request time of the uh, dinner, they wrote out their prayer request. And Father Peter was here and was able to interact with them uh, as well. But as they wrote their prayer request, they were all in Spanish. And so... Uh, the person that was gathering the requests didn't um, know how to translate those and, and send them out to all of our volunteers. But uh, if there's one thing I can do, I can read Spanish quite well, much better than I can speak. And so I translated them. And, and I was just brought to tears reading their prayer requests, thanking God for us and for the food and for the hospitality and praying for liberty for their country, for Cuba and Venezuela. They were praying for their country, and they were praying for their families, and they were giving thanks to God. Amazing words that they were sharing. And then this past 
uh, week, I went and uh, talked to, we had a guy that just got here from Nicaragua, had been in detention, I found out, for an entire year. Unable to speak with his family or be able to communicate. And then there was another guy that was here from Venezuela. He was visibly shaken, just being in shock of not knowing what was going on, what was going to happen to him, what building he was in, probably not even sure what city he was in. And as the volunteers were there working with him, feeling a sense of peace that would come. It's amazing. When we see what Jesus does in the life of a person who is in need, especially someone Jesus cares very much about, the stranger, the refugee, And so to be able to help them, we see more clearly what God is like. And we are amazed. And when all of that happens and we see what Jesus can do like the disciples on the sea that day, we too will want Jesus to come in the boat with us as we sail on. Let us pray.